Welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today in the show, we're joined by Colin Harper of Hashrate Index, head of content and research. With Colin, we talk about changes to network hash rate, ASIC price changes, and the soon-to-be Ethereum merge. But before that, let's get a quick word from our new sponsor, Foundry Digital. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. As a premier training and education program for professional mining technicians, Foundry Academy answers. From hands-on ASIC labs taught by industry veteran instructors to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact, Foundry Academy graduates acquire the skills facilities need to be off and mining. They've even built OSHA 10 certification into the curriculum. Open to all who hold a high school degree or equivalent, the next one-week course taking place in Rochester, New York, runs September 12th through the 17th. Visit foundryacademy.com to register or reach out to academy at foundrydigital.com. Colin, take two. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well, brother. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. Tell me about Tennessee. It's good, man. Um, obviously, it's uh, hotter than hell, but it's good to be back home. Got some rain here recently. Um, yeah, it's just nice to be back in the South, be around family and stuff. Totally. Totally. Yeah, it's been super hot out here during the summer so far in Colorado, which we will get to on this podcast, I'm sure, because a lot of miners out there have been suffering from uh, really high ambient temperatures. But what we really want to talk about is the hash rate index's new mining report uh, that came out, I think, two weeks ago now, just covering the first six months of mining during 2022. Obviously, there's been a lot going on with Bitcoin's price. Miners have been on the forefront of that, bearing a lot of the brunt of a down price. Uh, but there's been other things as well, right? Network difficulty has gone down recently because miners are unplugging. We've seen a lot of curtailment. Uh, we've seen just a lot of heat issues across the United States with this North American heat wave. Um, basic prices as well have started to tumble. So lots of lots of things to cover, but we'll just start off talking about the report, uh, maybe a quick overview, and then also some information about hash rate index because I don't think we've had anyone from Luxor, the hash rate index team on the podcast in a, in a quick minute. I think, yeah, the last, last person would have been Ethan. And that was last summer, I think. It was like in September. Um, and, yeah, uh, right. yeah, so it's, it's been a while. Um, so yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, thanks for having me, man. Super stoked uh, to be on just a uh, quick background to do, uh, research and content at Luxor, head of research and content. I kind of oversee all of the data stuff going on at Hashford Index, put out a weekly newsletter, um, Hashford Index Roundup, and then just any other content and, uh, research kind of long form stuff like, uh, I did with this report. So yeah, happy to just dive right into it. Um, where would you like to start? Yeah, let's start off with hash rate. Obviously, gotta start everything off with hash rate. Uh, hash rate. Getting the year, people were thinking 300x a hash. Bitcoin's price at the time was around fifty thousand dollars January one, and obviously it tumbled uh, to the point where where we at now, like twenty three thousand, twenty two two thousand dollars a coin. Network hash rate is more or less the same place, around two hundred x a hash. Uh, what's your takeaway from it? Obviously, we can probably move on from this topic pretty quickly because it's just pretty standard metric. Yeah, I think just for me, it's always a great reminder of like when things are really good, people think they're just going to keep getting better and kind of like this, it's the same when things are going sour, right? Um, during bull markets, people start throwing out crazy predictions for everything. You know, people said things like ASICs are going to be 20,000, new gen ASICs are going to be like, you know, uh, $20,000, like that's 19 this year. People thought hash rate was going to be like 300, 350x hashes. People thought Bitcoin was going to be at 100k a coin. And you can kind of see the same thing on the way down, right? Like people turning ultra bearish, calling for 10k or sub 10k, um, and also becoming bearish with some of their hash rate projections. So I think just generally, it's a good reminder that, um, you know, uh, things don't always pan out the way that we think they do, uh, given current sentiment. And also, just uh, as a good reminder that um, particularly in North America, during the hash rate migration from China, uh, people just got way ahead of their skis, right? And um, a lot of companies and a lot of private miners started uh, taking on debt to try to finance crazy expansions. Um, and, you know, um, physics kind of uh, has its own timeline, right? Like there's just not enough energy, not enough rack space. Things take longer to build out. Um, than people originally projected. And I think that what we're seeing right now is just, you know, um, people are really starting to kind of, uh, they're starting to realize that their models were overly optimistic. 
So um, just naturally, hash rate is growing a lot slower than people thought it would. People who were newer to the game are having to liquidate ASICs or um, just get out of the space entirely because they just didn't know what they were doing. Even some seasoned miners, right, like totally overplayed their hand. A lot of the big miners have more hash rate waiting on the sidelines than they have deployed right now. Uh, some of the bigger ones, at least. Some of the more well-run operators aren't, aren't necessarily in that boat. And the last thing I would say, too, I think a lot of the slowed hash rate growth we saw this summer and we can get into this uh, now or later, is also just curtailing, right? Like you kind of hit, it, hit it on it at the beginning of the podcast. Um, gets really freaking hot in the US in the summer, and a lot of the hash rate is home, and it doesn't really matter where you are, right? Like people talk about Texas, but there have been heat waves all over the US um, in the summer. Um, temperatures get way too hot, um, and so miners either have to shut off because uh, their machines can't take it, and they didn't really um, you know, properly structure their deployments, or... Um, the local grids are becoming stressed because people are running AC and there isn't enough energy to go around. So obviously the big consumers are the first to shut off. So I think a lot of the summer curtailing um, and especially mining hotspots like Texas has to uh, is kind of at play here too. Yeah. Uh, network hash rate is obviously like a, a very simple metric and most miners and most Bitcoiners are familiar with it. There's always like the, the Bitcoin magazine tweets or like the Bitcoin archive tweets, like network hash rates at all time high. And that's pretty standard to understand. Network hash rate go up is a good thing, it means miners are profitable. But when we're seeing stagnation like this, you can kind of read into it a little bit as well, right? It probably means that there's things going underneath the surface for miners that needs a little bit more scrutiny. And you brought up a few things. Uh, heat wave North America has been a huge deal. And then curtailment, another part along with that. And sometimes those two things are related and sometimes they're not related, right? So sometimes energy grid grids are curtailing because there's a lot of heat uh, on the local grid, there's a lot of pull from the local grid because people are turning on their ACs. And then sometimes people are just curtailing uh, just because the energy is needed elsewhere, right? So in the first case, and that's the normative case, uh, we have it even more specifically broken down where not every grid is the same, right? So Compass has a facility up in Ontario that's been under curtailment. And the temperature actually hasn't been that hot up there. It's been like probably 80 degrees or so. And most miners can like operate in that ambient temperatures of around 80 degrees, like fairly easily, especially if your cooling systems are correct. But the grid has been under curtailment because the local grid is not as robust to say something like in Texas or somewhere else, um, mainly because just like the infrastructure in the region is not necessarily behind, but it's built tailored to that population, right? It's built tailored to that industry. So what we're seeing right now is that a lot of miners out there are becoming more familiar with their local grid and the specifications for mining on their local grid and then having to change their mining operations accordingly. So to me, it's a big, big learning curve for North American mining uh, one year on. Uh, but yeah, we well, can leave that. Uh, sorry, just I want to capitalize on something you said. I think you tweeted a while ago. It's like uptime is the third leg of the ROI stool, right? Mm -hmm. um, and most people, when they're modeling it out, you know, they're like, oh, we'll just budget for like 98% uptime. And like when the summer rolls around, like I can just yeah. tell you from one of our deployments where I have rigs too in Illinois, I mean, they've just been curtailing nonstop. And, um, yep. you know, sometimes these companies have to because it's in their contracts. Other times they're doing it to arbitrage the energy prices. Um, yeah. And so kind of just yeah. to build on what you were saying, it's a mosaic of different reasons. And uh, I think that just uh, kind of the picture that we're getting painted, obviously, like you said, hash rate is stagnating. And, you know, if you've got rigs in a place where it's a little cooler or that curtailing hasn't happened, like off grid miners, like, you know, it's a great time for you because hash price is actually staying a lot steadier than we thought it would. Um, you know, we went below yeah. 10 cents a few months or a month or two ago. And. Now we're at 10 cents. We're back above, we were back above 10 cents uh, after that 5% difficulty adjustment. So anyway, um, it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, you're like, Oh, cool. Hash price is going back up because the hash rate isn't growing as much. But if your miners are down and you're not getting compensated for that, then it doesn't really matter for you. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Let's move on to the hash rate report that you guys put out the hash rate index report and talk about the cost to mine per state. That was a pretty interesting metric. And I saw that there was an 11% rise per state or average for mining. Uh, some interesting states that I saw in here, California, $26,000 to mine a Bitcoin. Alaska, $30,000 to mine per Bitcoin. Uh, so those are on like the far end, right? And then the more normal stuff we're seeing, Texas, about 11,000 to mine a Bitcoin. Pennsylvania, 12,000. Georgia, 12,000. Wyoming, 11,000. 
Uh, New York also around twelve thousand dollars. So this is a cool map. Uh, obviously, a lot of these numbers depend on like your costs and inputs. Uh, but I really thought this one was a, a super interesting sneak peek into the data. Curious how you guys collected this data and then what went into uh, projecting this outwards. Yeah, so um, quick, uh, just a quick caveat on the prices themselves. It was the uh, most updated prices I could find based on the EIA.gov website. And um, it is for average uh, industrial rates for April. Um, that being said, you know, these rates are probably a little bit higher now. You had a great article on Compass, uh, Compass's uh, content uh, arm on the blog about this. Um, about just like uh, rising energy costs and rising hosting costs. But yeah, so we, we scraped the data from EIA.gov and then we basically just extrapolated um, based on hash price and, um, you know, machine specifications. I believe this was for um, an S19 uh, and uh, I think it was a J Pro. But um, so, yeah, the thing that I think is most interesting about this is just when you look at some of the states that have much uh, lower electricity costs. It's kind of some of the sleeper states that actually not a lot of hash rate is concentrated in in the U.S., right? Like um, Texas is obviously huge. Um, you know, Kentucky and North Carolina, New York State, um, or other ones that come out, uh, North Dakota, Montana, um, all of these places obviously are generally pretty um, pretty big mining hubs. But then you have some other states with super cheap costs, like my home state of Tennessee, um, Oregon, uh, Washington as well, though Washington's kind of a tricky regulatory environment. They're pretty hostile towards miners. Um, but uh, to me, yeah, it shows that there's actually quite a lot of uh, optionality for some of these miners, right? Um, if some of these other states, uh, you know, if their costs are rising too high or they become, uh, you know, untenable from a regulatory perspective, there's a lot of places to go. Yeah. Shout out to Hawaii, which has a $58,000 cost to mine per Bitcoin. <laughs> That's pretty rough. <laughs> You're basically uh, breaking even a point at November 2022 prices or November 2021 prices rather. Uh, I thought that was a great graphic. Obviously, we're going to see more hash rates spread out across the United States. Um, we've seen Texas pop up a lot, but like if you look at some of the other uh, network imprints that we've seen from like pools, like Foundry did one, two last year, I believe. We see that like there's other states that people are not paying attention to. Georgia has a large imprint of hash rate. Uh, you said Kentucky, obviously New York is still there. I've seen a lot of Florida miners pop up. So that's cool just to, to see that in general. Let's move over to hash price though, which you just talked about. Drop below 10 cents, which was awful for, was it like a two week or four week period? And then luckily we had some reprieve, I guess some older generation machines, like they dropped off the network, um, maybe some curtailment caused us or like heat overload um, in like Texas or whatnot caused some miners to drop off. So hash price went back above 10 cents, which is a much better place to be. At the same time, hash price was below the lowest, which was Q4 2020 uh, during this, this recent event. Pretty tough place if you're new to mining and just getting into it and use hit hash price this low after maybe just purchasing an ASIC or all-time highs or relatively near all-time highs, that's a pretty uh, lethal one-two combo. Yeah, that's definitely a gut punch. Um, yeah, so just some like you kind of covered it, but just kind of like the straight skinny uh, hash price is basically back to where it was in Q4 of 2020, right before the bull market really uh, kicked off. Um, part of a lot of the investor fervor last year was driven by the fact that once China banned Bitcoin mining, um, there was such a reduction in network competition. You know, 50 to 60% of all of the miners uh, in the world were just like clipped their hash rate, shut off. Some stayed in China for longer and are still there. The ones that are politically connected, most of that moved and took a long time to get back online. So hash price was actually um, hit uh, nearly an all time high or nearly uh, uh, the yearly high last year was in November. But in um, June or in July, it went up to like 40 cents for a brief period there, which was just two cents below the yearly high in November. And Bitcoin's price was cut in half during that time, right? So I guess all that to say, um, to piece that together, it was uniquely profitable last year, even with Bitcoin price uh, depressed during that migration. And then when Bitcoin's price went back up, some of those machines got turned back on. You still had a lot of... Uh, 
you still had a pretty elevated hash price. And so now, you know, hash price is basically uh, the yearly average last year was 30, uh, like $30 a day for an S19. So 30 cents per tera hash per day. And uh, now it's basically a third of that. And like you said, for miners who came in last year and basically bought, you know, all time high prices for new gen machines, uh, S19s, uh, you know, it's common to see them go for anywhere from nine to $12,000 at the peak last year. Now they're looking at their revenues being, you know, cut in by 66%. And that's brutal. And um, there's one specific graphic in this uh, report uh, that I'll point readers to on page 11, the hash price for break even analysis. If you, we look at um, the profits that miners would have been making last year um, in, uh, in, I think, April. Yeah. So in April of last year versus April of this year, and um, you know, it's the margins have just completely thinned. Uh, miners who are higher up the cost ladder have higher electricity or hosting prices are going to be in trouble if we go below seven cents, which I think we touched like seven and a half cents uh, per terahash per day um, in I want to say in late June or early July. And you know, if if a lot of these S19 XP orders that some of the big miners are getting uh, getting in July at the end of July and in August and throughout the rest of the year, if those guys can really plug in all the orders that they have, you know, we're going to see hash price go below uh, the bear market uh, threshold last year, which I think it got as low as seven cents. I think that's the lowest it got in 2020. And so, uh, sorry, not last year, back in last bear market. So like that was the low in 2020. You know, I, I expect unless Bitcoin just does a U-turn in price, we'll probably get back to that, this bear market as well. Yeah, it's pretty rough, uh, especially if you bought an ASIC at all time prices and just tells you how fast that drop off can be, right? I mean, ASICs were still trading probably eight, was it like $70 per tera hash in February, March, maybe even more than that. And then pretty quickly, like we're seeing dollar per tera hash for machines dropping considerably, where I'm seeing around, I've seen as low as $19 per tera hash. Um, I'm sure there's even cheaper liquidations, but I've seen stuff between like $25 and $30 per tera hash. So that's pretty rough. Before we move on to uh, ASIC rate prices, though, just talking more about hash price, there's a few different conversations you can have out of this. And one would be where does the market go from here with such large drops in revenues, sustained revenues going forward going to be very low? And then two, like how does an individual miner squeeze out as much profit from their machine or from their mining farm given such low revenues going forward? And on the first topic, I'll wrap it up really quickly um, and can toss it to you for your thoughts. If hash price is this low, this is pretty rough for a lot of public miners and large private miners and miners in general, but I'm assuming most retail miners are and they're they're not eating because they are mining Bitcoin. They have other sources of income. So they're okay. But some of these private miners or public miners, they need this hash price to go up or be sustained around 10 cents in order to pay off loans, continue the operations pay for future orders of machines, pay for staffing, pay for infrastructure. And their projections were based on a hash price that was very different. And so I think you and I both have the sentiment that there's going to not only be a lot of private washouts, but at least maybe one public miner could also wash out and go to chapter 11 because they didn't project out what hash price looks like going to the future. Yeah, I think that that's generally right. You know, I think that um, the story of this bear market is going to be whoever's the leanest will eat the longest. You know, and you have a lot of public miners who have just got way too over leveraged last year, have way too much debt on the books. And we've kind of already seen the chickens come home to roost for that, right? Um, Arcane Research had some really good charts on this. It was like in last month, um, it was either June or July, Bitcoin miners sold like 400% of what they actually produced of the public miners. And um, I mean, that's just insane to see, right? Like BitFarm sold like 3,000 Bitcoin. Core Scientific sold basically its entire balance sheet of Bitcoin or its entire treasury of Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, Riot sold some, has been kind of chipping away. Um, I don't think Mara has sold any, at least maybe they sold some last, uh, last we'll month. We'll find out this month. Yeah, we'll find, find out, out soon. <laughs> um, but so, you know, a lot of these miners are kind of starting to feel the pressure and they're kind of liquidating what they can to try to cover those costs. And to your point, yeah, if hash price goes uh, lower and we stay in a prolonged bear market, I don't really see a scenario in which you don't have 
some distressed asset sales, or like you said, an outright bankruptcy. Um, and as for like the retail miners, you know, it kind of sucks for some of these guys, but they'll probably just shut off unless they're just, you know, rabid about getting KYC free Bitcoin, or they have like really good connections and are getting pretty cheap energy. Um, depending on the energy source, I think off-grid miners kind of thrive in this market. A great example is actually Colorado, your home state, right? Mm-hmm. Since Jared Polis uh, and I th- or the legislature, I don't know which, um, but since they signed uh, basically that they made the, they signed into law this a bill that basically prevents flaring. Um, and the only way that oil producers in the state of Colorado now can dispatch natural gas and even keep their wells running is if they have someone to consume that gas on site through a generator. Well, yeah. the only the only industry that will be able to do that for them is Bitcoin mining, right? And so for yeah. guys like that, you know, the even the price of natural gas is kind of, doesn't even really probably factor in for something yeah. like that, right? Because the gas would just be wasted anyway, and these oil producers can't draw the oil without uh, the miners. So guys oh, yeah. like that who are kind of scrappier are going to be in a good position. And um, I think that uh, there's going to be, unfortunately, though, just a lot of pain up and down the ladder from the institutional side of things and the retail side of things. Um, as for your last uh, question about squeezing out what you can, you know, I think that um, just the name of the game here is just uh, kind of if if you are low, if you have low leverage and you don't have to cover any costs, um, maybe you bide your time mine at a slight loss or mine at break even and just hold those those uh, Bitcoin until uh, we yep. hit another market cycle, right? Another thing too is maybe if you think ASIC prices are going to go lower and you're worried about your costs, then you know sell some of those rigs now and kind of pare down uh, your ASIC portfolio and try to recoup those costs, hold some of it in cash and maybe wait for bar- uh, bargain bin prices. Um, but of course, you could say the same thing about holding Bitcoin itself. Um, no one really knows what's going to happen. The Fed could pivot, you know, and then all of this is a moot point, and then we just rip yeah. again. You know, I don't necessarily yeah. think that's going to happen, and uh, I uh, I would like to have you know better analysis than just like whatever the Fed does. That's what the markets are going to do. But I think that um, yeah, just going back to what I said to begin with, just if you're lean and you're not over leveraged, you just have to bide your time here. And if that means you have to shut off for a while until things become profitable again, then maybe that's just the best case scenario. Yeah, totally. No, I agree with you on all that. Just to respond to the last point about like maximizing profit during a bear market. We had a great podcast in April, I want to say, with Bitspeed Trip and Michael Carter, a very successful YouTuber and early, early Bitcoin miner. I think 2010 is when he first started mining Bitcoin just for fun. Uh, talking about like how to make it through a bear market as a Bitcoin miner. And one strategy he suggested, just turn off when the month, it's a bad month, turn off for that month. And then uh, if you have some sort of thesis for how much Bitcoin you want to allocate through mining or accumulate rather, go buy that Bitcoin spot and then turn back on your operation when you can. Uh, There's always this boom bust cycle to Bitcoin. It's going to happen. And we just have to be in the drawdown right now. So uh, there's not as many ways to maximize your profits right now. Uh, maybe if interest rates really rip up to 20%, we get Volcker rates. Maybe you could uh, liquidate some Bitcoin and put it up for interest. That's one possibility. But a lot of the old tricks and techniques are not there anymore unless you want to invest in more tech. If you want to invest in more immersion, get more hash rate out of your machine, that's always possible. But that means spending more money in order to get that machine up and running. So. Kind of a tough place to be, but I think it's just holding the faith, just like you said, Colin. Like, yeah, and on you know, the, on the note of immersion too, for like specifically retail or smaller, small time miners or home miners. I mean, like you're already probably break even uh, for like most, uh, you know, most uh, electricity costs. I think like the average in the U.S. is like twelve to thirteen cents. So like, if you're running an S19 or an M30 S plus plus, you're at break even right now, or just above it. Yeah. Uh, and so for guys like that, though, you know, most of the smart ones already know this, anything that you can do to recycle anything like the heat or kind of offset costs by, um, you know, I mean, not in, the, not in the summer, right? But if it's the winter by heating your home or, you know, if you're like coin heated and you got to heat the jacuzzi or the pool, anything <laughs> that you can do to kind of like recycle the, uh, the heat from this or um, kind of improve operational efficiencies, then you're going to be a step ahead and be able to stay online longer than the other guy. 
there's definitely ways to maximize profits just by offsetting other costs. I would say that you have to put more time into it. Whatever you do, there's not going to be easy pickings as there were during the bull market to make profit. Uh, during bull market, obviously, you just have to sit back and make sure your machine was online. But during the bear market, you have to be more proactive, thinking of ways of reusing that heat, lowering costs, lowering energy costs, things like that. Let's move over to ASIC rig prices, though, which obviously hash rate index. This is probably the premier product you guys offer. No one else quite does this like you guys do. Looking at three different classifications. So this is machines under 38 joules per terahash efficiency, 38 to 68 joules per terahash efficiency, and over 68 terahash joules per terahash efficiency. Basically, S19s, maybe like an M20, and then like an S9 would be sort of the general classifications I try to think of these as. They're all down over 50%, with the middle group down 66% since the beginning of the year. And then year over year, the best class S19 plus S19 or above is down 40% and everything past that is down 50%. So pretty rough for ASICs out there. At the same time, it seems like there's a good opportunity for marketplaces to start selling these ASICs, start spinning them around, maybe for people who have been holding capital to invest in ASICs right now. Um, I saw Ethan Vera, your guys is he COO now or what is his title now? I always forget. A bit of everything. He used to be CFO, now he's COO. There we go. Okay, I nailed it. Uh, I saw Ethan Vera, your CEO, tweeting about ASIC prices hitting sort of a floor. There's a wall for selling these machines. Uh, be curious to get your take on not only how you guys find these prices, but how you've been tracking them and where you see them going from here. Yeah, so um, the ASIC price index scrapes um, individual uh, pricing data from... I can't tell you how many, I don't know, but it's like, there's a there's dozens of sources. And I think uh, we each update is like over 4,000 individual data points or like 5,000. We kind of add to it as we go, as we can, as new, in, uh, you know, sellers into the market like Compass or, uh, you know, upstream data sells ASICs now. Um, and so the more data sets, obviously the better we can kind of get a holistic view. So, um, yeah, we've got basically, um, you know, a script that scrapes all of those prices and then we aggregate them each week. Uh, some of them we leave out because they're either, uh, they like muddy the data set or like the minimum order quantity is like a thousand or something. And so it, it doesn't, um, you know, uh, things like that can kind of skew the data set. So we'll leave some of those out and we refine it as we go. Um, in terms of kind of trends that we're seeing here, um, Kind of like what Ethan said, I don't want to say we're bouncing right now, but we definitely seem to hit a threshold. Um, I remember looking at uh, Luxor's ASIC brokerage page or ASIC brokerage desk. And I remember seeing new gen machines going for like $25 per terahash when things got really bad, when we dipped to 17 or 18K, you know, some miners feeling pain and kind of just throwing out a fire sale price because they have to liquidate immediately. Um, I think that... Um, one good reminder for me while doing this report, and this kind of goes without saying in a way, because obviously everything follows Bitcoin, but like if Bitcoin is your unit of account in all of this, strangely enough, you kind of, you're kind of doing better than if you were using USD. And what I mean by that is like, if you bought the top of the ASIC market last year with your Bitcoin holdings, you're not really too sour about that in a way, because you basically shed your Bitcoin when it was at was at or near an all-time high. And you basically traded that for hash rate, which is now producing Bitcoin for you every day. Um, whereas if you bought that with USD, maybe you're kicking yourself a little bit because you could have waited for cheaper rig prices now, right? Um, yeah, so that's kind of an aside. But in terms of overall trends, um, I don't really foresee uh, you know, the ASIC market uh, hockey sticking, right? Uh, anytime soon. Um, I, I also don't necessarily think we've seen the bottom yet. Um, maybe uh, if if Bitcoin doesn't puke again, then we have seen the bottom. But uh, as Ethan said, we've seen a lot of sellers kind of sitting around uh, or buyers sitting around asking for really low ball prices that they just haven't had filled. So um, prices are pretty good right now compared to they were last year. It uh, doesn't mean that they won't go lower, obviously. Okay, we'll get to predictions and then we'll finish up the conversation talking about the Ethereum merge, which is happening pretty soon here. Uh, my favorite topic, of course, and yours too. <laughs> soon TM. 
uh, predictions. Where will network hash rate be by the end of this year? Mm, so I'm taking the bearish thing here. I actually did the, uh, had this prediction for our Q1 report. Um, I think I said 255 exahashes. I mean, it, I would be surprised um, if we got anywhere near 300. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are a lot of XPs that are going to be delivered here pretty soon. That's going to be a tidal wave of hash rate. But, you know, um, some of the big miners uh, like Mara who have been purchasing XPs and other miners um, all day long um, last year, right? Like they have massive orders. You know, not all of those have gotten plugged in. Um, yeah. And even when they do, you know, there's been some problem or there's curtailment. So, yeah, I would say like 260. I think is, is, is reasonable. Um, I hope that I'm right. And I hope that it's even less than that. Um, because, I, but again, I just don't really see, you know, even a lot of these big industrial miners, like they're getting pretty close to their marginal cost of production, not to mention their cost of production when you factor in everything else. Yeah. So, you know, I just don't know, at least in the U S where a lot of these guys are going to plug in machines. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of machines in Texas turning on going into the fall months as ERCOT lets loose a little bit since we're heading into the, the fall, be less demand on the grid for energy. Um, so I think we'll have more machines turn on there and that could be a decent bump. And then Marathon, maybe some others, yeah, they get some machines online. So I'm what's, your, what's, your, uh, what's your projection? I'm pretty optimistic for 250 as well. I think 275 would be the high end, mm -hmm. I'm comfortable saying. But it is funny just to go back through the podcast and I ask almost everybody this question. And most people in January were saying like 300 easy. I think it, I even had one person say 350. And now we're like, oh, 250 maybe. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, I, have, learning. I have it easy. I have the benefit of looking at all the market carnage and like being like, yeah. oh, we're only five months out to the end of the year. This yeah. is pretty safe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little unfair. Okay, let's turn to the Ethereum merge. Which I just saw from a tweet that Poloniex is actually going to list ETHPOW, the token that is expected to. Yeah, starting. That's yeah. that's that's the one thing that's been missing from this equation. And uh -huh. if Poloniex does it, Binance will do it. Kraken will do it. Anyway, sorry. Well, lay lay the landscape for us, Colin. Tell us what's going to happen with ETH POS, ETH POW. Why is it going to be token? What are well, miners? Ethereum two point is just never going to launch, right? True. True. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I joke, but um, I do think that um, I have no reason to believe that it will actually go this September. Um, maybe they do just like YOLO it and then send it, right? Which I think would be really, really dumb without further testing. Uh, Christine Kim, actually, of Galaxy, one of our former colleagues at Coindesk, just put out a really good report about um, basically, I, di I didn't look into it too deeply, um, but it's basically a vulnerability um, with. Um, uh, we call it maximal extractive value now, right? It's no longer my yeah, change it value. all the time. Yeah. Anyway, MEV, um, the the process by which um traders or um I don't know hunters or whatever you want to call them, um, basically partner with mining pools to maximize profits from trades. There's a bunch of different ways to do this. Uh, you should check out Will's work. He's written a lot about this, both at CoinDesk and at Compass. He's got really good rundowns of it. Um, but all that being said, there's still a lot of question marks in terms of like what. Ethereum will do uh, what it will look like when it moves and some of these outstanding vulnerabilities. But to kind of give a lay of the landscape right now, it seems that there are three camps in terms of uh, what miners are trying to do. Um, we at Luxor, along with some other miners, are trying to push for just Ethereum staying proof of work. Um, full disclosure, even though it goes against my company's party line, like I don't think that's going to happen. I think that it's good to make the stance and try to say that, you know, like, we're standing up for our miners and standing up for our industry, and we just don't consent to this change, right? Um, building on that, there's going to be plenty of miners who support a fork of Ethereum that stays proof of work. Um, this will be a huge technical lift. Um, it will require diffusing the difficulty bomb, which I, I do not understand well enough. But as I understand, this is actually one of the bigger problems with this approach is that the difficulty bomb is still in there. And also, this approach would have been better before EIP one five five nine because that's the uh, you know the Ethereum proof proposal that uh, burnt fees and replaced them with tips. Um, so, like this kind of fork, honestly, would have been better to do before that happened, as I also understand it from some people in the conversations. 
Um, and so that's the second camp. The third camp is just whatever blockchain will take them, right? So um, Ethereum Classic has obviously been talked about here. Um, and uh, there are a few other ones. Uh, but you know, the question with that is, um, the reason that Ethereum is so profitable to mine is because there's so much built on the ecosystem, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, um, it's the largest smart contract uh, ecosystem out there. Um, there's billions of dollars in, in additional value, not, you know, not even including Ethereum itself. And so a lot of these miners who just don't have cheap enough electricity or are not well positioned are probably just going to shut off and sell their graphics cards. Um, yeah. if, I'm, if I'm making myself clear enough, there's just not enough value on some of these other chains to even justify mining them, especially if all the Ethereum miners come over. So um, that's also why I think in terms of forking Ethereum to proof of work, um, the only way that that's going to be sustainable <clears throat> is not just if exchanges list the token so that there's a trading avenue for it, but are you going to fork all of the dApps too? And all of the, oh, that's such, I'm showing my age. That's such an outdated term. Are you going to, are you going to fork all of the DeFi applications and fork all of the other things, which I think naturally that will happen. I think yeah. there probably will be value accrual here if there's nothing that goes wrong with it. Um, yeah. But um that being said, just kind of last thing on the proof of stake merge, um, no pun intended, there is a whole lot at stake here. And, um, you know, this is not like you just send an update and then every like with your computer and then you uh, then you download the update and everything's fine and you're in sync with all the other uh, Windows machines or Apple machines, right? There are thousands of applications built on top of Ethereum and all of them have to comply with the merge and update accordingly yeah. or else you risk having breakages, people losing money. And, you know, I don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility that some of those developers are just like, mm, I don't really want to move the proof of stake. This seems like a big engineering lift. Um, proof of work works for us right now. If there's a fork to that, then we're just going to run that code. Um, yeah. It's it's a it's a huge mess, honestly, and it's going to be one of those. It, to me, it's the most interesting story um, of, of even mining right now. I mean, notwithstanding all the stuff going on in Bitcoin mining, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things to pluck out there with public companies and ASIC prices and hash price. But um, this kind of upgrade has never been done before, and the yeah. game theory of what's actually going to happen to all of this hash rate uh, to me is just super fascinating. Yeah, we're gonna have to do a specific podcast or maybe one or two on the Ethereum merge before it before it possibly goes live in September. Um, I'm optimistic that it goes live. I did see that report from Christine Kim over at Galaxy Digital. Shout out to Christine. We'll see what happens with that and if people take a pause because of it. And that would be pretty in line with what we've seen in the past, right? Where we've gotten very close to the date and then someone raises a red flag about some sort of attack vector. And then they decide, hey, we'd, we'd rather wait. And to me, that just tells you about how robust proof of work is, the ability to move in and out of it. Uh, it's the only system that allows you to do something like that. So um, that has been one takeaway for me. And then we'll obviously see what happens with a, a merge to proof of stake. If there's going to be another network, I don't know why ETHPOW would necessarily exist if Ethereum Classic exists. And it's more or less kept up to date with all the Ethereum changes besides proof of stake. Uh, there'll probably be some contention there, but yes, the next six weeks with Ethereum will definitely be some fireworks. And even though a lot of people who listen to this podcast are not going to want to listen to any Ethereum topics, it is a very interesting consensus and mining topic in general. So we'll, we'll stay abreast of it. Colin, thanks so much for joining us on the, the Compass podcast. Really appreciate your time and hopefully see you again soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me on, man. Love jamming out and uh, yeah, happy to come on anytime.